Hello, everybody. I'm Hunter Ohanian, and I am the director of the Stonewall National Museum and Archives located here in Palm Beach, uh, Palm Beach, in Fort Lauderdale. Sorry, I'm, I'm speaking to you all from Pompano Beach, from my, my home. And so this is a series of readings, lectures, and talks that we've been doing um, as a result of the coronavirus and how the world has changed. Um, this talk uh, will be on our website. It will be part of our archive. We're making this talk today on, uh, on May 20th, 2020. And of course, our guest here today is Julie Marie Wade. Uh, and so we're very happy to have Julie here. Julie, just say hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, and Julie, tell us where are, we, where are we finding you today? I'm in Hollywood, Florida. Hollywood, yeah. How long have you been in Hollywood? Uh, five years, uh, but South Florida for eight. Great, good. And so great to have you here. It was wonderful mm -hmm. to, to meet you. you. You and I met at an event at the Hollywood uh, Arts and Cultural Center probably a few months ago, and so that was great. Um, yes. Yep. So um, just to, again, just to put some historic context on this. Um, so uh, today, uh, I'm looking at the date on my computer's May 20th. Um, we are now in the 10th week of a national uh, worldwide pandemic. Um, for all intents and purposes, uh, the United States government has been shut down. However, um, there are signs that it is beginning to, uh, to reopen. Um, and um, the pandemic is a result of a virus known as the coronavirus. Um, in my notes from two weeks ago, from a talk two, two weeks ago, uh, ago I noted that 76,000 Americans had lost their lives. Um, as of this afternoon, uh, that number has jumped in a two-week period uh, by almost 20,000 people. Uh, there are 93,000 people in the United States who have uh, lost their, their lives. Um, the impact, of course, has been quite significant on the economy. Um, Again, two weeks ago, uh, 20 million Americans had lost their job. We are now at over 36 million people have filed for unemployment claims. Uh, that's more than one tenth. It's more than 10 percent of the pop of the working population of the United States. Um, the good news, excuse me, is that parts of the country are beginning to come back. Um, and it's one of the reasons why we are doing this series of talks and lectures online. <laughs> it seems that <clears throat> everybody has a Zoom account now and everything's being done remotely, whether it's family or something else. Uh, the idea of doing talks with uh, um, artists or writers um, or cu curators remotely like this would be sort of almost unheard of. Um, two months ago, but this has now become the, the norm and it's a great way to actually reach people nationally. Mm -hmm. For those of you who are not here, I see people keep on popping up and a lot of you are not familiar with us. Uh, the Stonewall National uh, Museum and Archives is located here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, we are one of a series of gay archives throughout the United States. In our library, we have 28,000 volumes, which is uh, rumored to be the largest LGBTQ library in the world. In our archive, we have over uh, 2,700 linear feet. And if you want to know how much that is, imagine going up one side of the Empire State Building and then coming all the way down the other, and then you can uh, drive all the way uh, to the tip of Manhattan. And, uh, and in, in documentation, it's about 6 million pages of what we have in our archives. That basically represents um, LGBTQ culture uh, from the last quarter of the 20th century to the present day. Um, and so you can find out everything about Stonewall at our website, uh, Stonewall dash museum.org and you can find everything um, about us there and please be sure to sign up for our newsletter you, we have lots of great readings and events that are coming up um, through this forum as well as through other forums as well too and so it's a great way for you to uh, become engaged with literature history archival visual arts um, that all happens just happens to have a queer bent to the whole thing and so um, 
uh, please feel free to re reach out to us. And also, by the way, this is week three, I think, of the series. Um, they've been very popular. And uh, if there are people that you want us to interview, uh, just let us know and uh, we'll be happy to get them signed up. We're booked, I think, through the middle of July so far, and I have a bunch of people on the list, but we'll continue to be, uh, to, to be scheduling the people. And I do actually think this is a series of engaging audiences that will have some likes going forward. And so um, uh, your input, of course, programming like this only, uh, only is successful if you give us an input. So please get, give us what, what you can. So um, I'm very pleased uh, to present Julie Marie Wade uh, this afternoon or this e evening. Um, Julie, I have, here are the books that I have on the list of books by you. Wishbone, A Memoir in Fractures, uh, Without Poems, Postage Due, Poems and Prose Poems, Tremolo, An Essay, uh, When I Was Straight, Poems, uh, Catechism, a love story, and as a lapsed Catholic, I certainly love hearing about that. Uh, and uh, six poems, um, which were selected by C.D. Wright as well, too. So um, you have won, the list of awards that you have won is really, um, well, I mean, there's more here on the list. The Unrhymables, um, uh, Just an Ordinary Woman Breathing. Um, Julie, how many books do you have right now? Um, I think I think it's eleven. And yeah. <laughs> I want to say um, I want to say the Unrhymables. It's a collaboration with Denise Duhamel, and that's a, a really special fact um, that I got to write a book with someone, uh, a writer I admire so much. Uh, so I guess ten books uh, just by me, and then that book also with Denise. I mean, that's an amazing accomplishment as a writer and as a p poet. And I and I've read qu quite a few of your books now. And I think that regardless of the form of, of the of the traditional form, you are a poet all the way throughout these books. And so, so. <laughs> <laughs> and so I really, I really enjoy seeing that in your prose and in your language going through there. And so you've won a bazillion and a half awards. Um, and then also you've been teaching for a l long time. Tell us a little bit about your t teaching. Uh, so actually, this is the end of um, my 18th year teaching, um, which is unreal. It's gone really fast. I, I want to be teaching, um, you know, forever. Um, but I started right out of college. I went right into a master's program um, at Western Washington University. Um, they had an absolutely tremendous uh, mentoring program for graduate students who um, were funded and were learning how to teach. And um, I started teaching, you know, rhetoric and composition, like most uh, young graduate students just starting a master's program. And I loved it. And then um, just kept going to more school because I loved the school. And every time I went to more school, um, I got to teach more things. And so, um, you know, spent a lot of time teaching women's studies, um, gender and sexuality studies, uh, literature classes, interdisciplinary humanities classes. Um, but the kind of like the golden ticket for me was always that I hoped I could someday uh, teach creative writing. Um, like sometimes I would get to teach in, um, you know, like a community workshop now and then, or um, I got to be involved with the Young Writers Institute when I lived in Pittsburgh and, and work with um, little kids and teenagers. Um, but the, the big dream was always that I would get to bring everything finally together and teach creative writing. Um, and then that dream came true in 2012 when I, when I came to FIU. Um, so I've been, I've been teaching uh, creative writing now for eight years. Yeah, that's terrific. All right. So, so this is kind of a strange off the, off the wall question, but um, so if you are, let's say, for example, you just, you end up in a hospital, it's nothing really terrible. Okay. And um, you're talking to a doctor and he's being nice to you. And he says to you, so what do you do? What is the first word that comes out of your mouth for your profession? I always say I teach. Oh, interesting. But you are a poet. I am. I guess I always, I always think of being a poet as my core identity, um, something that always felt true even before I wrote poems. <laughs> I was identifying as a poet as a little kid and I wasn't writing anything that looked like a poem. <laughs> Um, I wasn't always even writing anything that looked like prose. I was just in my mind. I felt that I had the the um, the soul of a poet or the the sense of myself as a poet. But um, I always say I teach um, because I think um, for me anyway, that's the like that's the vocational calling. I I know that I would be writing 
no matter what else I was doing. And I've done a lot of other things um, to supplement my teaching life along the way, as most grad students, most perpetual grad students, right, have a lot of other jobs um, to, to pay the bills. But I, I guess I always say I teach because that was the, that was the dream to be able to have that as the, as the way to pay my bills. Great. But in your heart, you are definitely a poet. I see that coming out of your, your work. No, I, I, I agree. I am a poet. And I, I'm lucky I get to teach the thing that I am. I, right. I'm really lucky to teach poetry now. Great. So for those of you who are joining us, um, we're going to start the re reading in about two seconds. If you have questions, uh, please feel free to post them. Um, there's a Q&A part that you can post them there, uh, or there's a chat part. Uh, we're going to go through a, a number of things that Julie and I have, have gone through um, in preparation for t today, but please post your questions and we'll do those in the last 15 minutes of this. Uh, we will end this probably at around 6.30, I'm sorry, at 7.30, so, uh, so hang on to your quick questions and let's keep it going. All right, so Julie, um, let's start with same-sex marriage. All right, let's do it. Um, I have notes from you of um, the three poems that you specifically wanted me to read from this book. Um, do you want me to just read those three poems or do you want, um, do you want to talk in between? Yeah, well, I think what I want you to do, because in, you've certainly put, pointed this out, and I think it's, I mean, from my eye, it's, it's definitely true, um, but there is an arc to the work that you've done in these books, and there's something that you want the reader to get out of the book as well. So when we pull a few of these things out, I, 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 if you could set it up for us, uh, for those who have not actually read the entire book, but if you could set it up for us as to what you want the reader to get out of this book. Sure. Um, so it looks like this, um, Same Sexy Marriage. Um, this is uh, a beautiful series of books. Um, I want to thank the editor and publisher of A Midsummer Night's Press, Lawrence Schimmel, um, who puts together these beautiful books. They're small, so they can fit in a pocket, but um, we always talk about them as small books with big ideas. And this is the body language series, um, which I've been a reader of for a long time. And I feel really lucky to have two books on that series. Um, so the, the, Thing I guess I would want you to know about same sexy marriage. Um, if you read the whole book, you will discover that the title actually comes from a typo um, in, a, in a letter that I received from work, um, letting me know that my same sexy marriage um, could not be recognized at that time. Um, so the, the backstory of the book is that um, it does lead up through um, the, the decade before um, my partner and I could be married legally. And then in my own life, um, there was a strange gap of getting married in 2014 um, in my home state of Washington where my marriage was legal, but then um, Angie and I coming back to Florida um, where same-sex marriage was still banned um, until January of 2015. And then of course, nationally wasn't um, legal everywhere until June of 2015. So there was a strange, it's, it was a different kind of gap year of being married, but not being recognized as married where I lived um, but the so the book was written after um, after full national marriage equality had happened um, but the the sort of twin arcs of the book are that um, years and years ago after my partner and I first left Washington State and moved to Pennsylvania we um, had heard through the grapevine from a, an old family friend um, of my parents that um, the way that my mother had explained my absence was that I had married a surgeon. And um, that obviously for my mother's community meant a man um, and was living in New England, which was um, funny and absurd in all kinds of ways, including the fact that none of us had ever been to New England. Um, and so it, it just seemed like this vast far away on the west coast of the country that you could just sort of marry me off and send me there. So, um, so the narrative poems in the book are a mix of poems about the other Julie, um, because I spent a lot of time over the years imagining what if I had been that daughter who, who married um, a male surgeon um, and went to live in a, in a sort of um, upscale New England life and um, what would her life look like as the years pass by. Um, so there are speculative poems and then there are also more autobiographical poems of my real life um, in which I couldn't actually for a long time marry the person that I loved and in which we were no way 
shape or form in, in New England or um, either of a surgeon. So kind of um, two parallel tracks. And then the book has some um, surprises that I didn't even know were going to happen until I until I wrote it. So um, but I think the poems that, that Hunter wanted me to read, um, when I looked at them, they were um, good examples of poems that also kind of stand alone. Like you don't have to know all the other things that are happening in the story. Um, and the first one, if I'm not mistaken, that you wanted me to read um, is a poem um, called my daughter's a lesbian and all I got is this lousy beach house. Um, so this poem will set up some, um, some more of, I guess, the, the sort of the plot arc of this book. My daughter's a lesbian and all I got is this lousy beach house. Grandpa John bought a pot of, plot of land on the Oregon coast in 1956 when sand was cheaper than dirt, he said. My father took me there in the 1980s, only once. We stood on a dune blooming with grass while my mother, not partial to beaches or oceans, sat in the car and sold. This was my dad's dream, he told me, to bring the whole family here for the one warm month of the year. But Grandpa John died young in 1971, and my father's sister died young too, without ever marrying anyone. We'll build a house on this land, Dad promised me, as we fidgeted in our slickers, cinching the hoods. When you grow up, you can come here every summer with your husband and kids. Since my mother laid on the horn. But when I grew up, I took a hard pass on the husband, declined the coverage for kids. I moved to a condo on the other coast with the woman I love, where the beach is our own backyard. My father sends letters to Florida now, sometimes frantic, other times stern. It's your duty to return to Washington, he writes, then clarifies that I must come alone. We built the beach house, he revealed in a recent note. Your mother has 5,000 square feet to decorate, and she agrees with me that it's a lovely refuge from the city. When I send my mother a housewarming gift, rustic lantern with votive candles and a coffee table book. Her reply belies the daisy stationery, the sweet peas on her forever stamp, but not the bare left corner. Who in the name of all that's holy told you about our house at the shore? Don't get any bright ideas. Now the peaks in her script turn sharp as spears about coming here and ruining everything. I've worked so hard for. So amazing and just so, 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 um, so filled with emotion. Uh, what year did you write that poem? Actually, with the exception of one poem in this book, they were all written in uh, 2017, really close together. Um, it, was, it was a spring semester and I was teaching poetic techniques at FIU and I always write with my students, like if they're writing poems, I'm writing poems. And I just said, this is the semester. This has been brewing for years. This is a semester I'm just sitting down and doing it. And then one poem, um, uh, the shooting pool with Anne Heche poem that I'm gonna read, um, that poem is actually goes back to 2008 and it, it didn't have a, a home in a larger manuscript. And I thought, ah, oh, that's where it goes. It goes in that book. Yeah, it's so, it's so, uh... I think there's so many people that can relate to to what you've said here and how you've actually said it. Um, can we move on in the same book? And also, I do want to apologize and correct myself that the name of this book is Same Sexy Marriage as opposed to Same Sex Marriage. I, I uh, did not say the why bit before. But can we move to a poem on page 26? Sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, when my parents join a senior center in redacted Oregon. Well, it's just a real pleasure to meet you folks, says Rand at the central kiosk. All I need is proof of residence and we'll get this registration party started. My mother clocks his bushy sideburns, desperate for a trim. The Kermit the Frog necktie peeking between buttons of his denim vest. It's all she can do not to roll her eyes. Now, will you be living here full time or just part of the year? Part, she clarifies. We have a house in Seattle, symphony tickets, that sort of thing. He nods, hands the forms to my father. 
And then, of course, there are the grandkids in Burlington. So we spend a fair amount of time in Vermont. Well, that is quite a quinky dink, Rand explains, lifting his glasses to the crown of his head, squinting gleefully at both of them. You're not going to believe this, but you've got three guesses as to where my people are from. Hmm. Amazing. Thank you, and thank you for allowing me to throw that one in. I tagged that one before, and I hadn't sent that. I hadn't sent that one too. All right, so let's move over to page forty of the book, and um, there's a political uh, figure that you have mentioned uh, in this poem, and help help us to understand um, how politics plays a role in the work that you do. Well, uh, you know, I, I have my, my feminist training and I have my feminist um, embrace of the idea that the personal is always political. And, and I love the idea of the consciousness raising groups of the 60s and 70s, which I wasn't around for specifically, but I, I like that idea of um, people coming together and telling their stories um, and figuring out how their stories might reflect something bigger about the culture. Um, and one of the people that I've been fascinated by um, more recently, like since, since being an adult, um, has been Mary Cheney, who's the subject of this poem, because I've been trying to figure out how other people navigate um, complicated relationships with parents, um, in, in their case, like the, the case of the Cheneys, like being a national family and being in the public eye in a way that of course I'm not, but that idea that also the political is personal. So trying to figure out like, what is that like to be the daughter of someone who becomes the vice president and um, is Republican and conservative and um, to stay, uh, as my parents are Republican and conservative, but to stay with that party, to stay with that um, set of, of values and ideologies, but also to be trying to live your life as an out lesbian, having a partner, marrying her, having children, how do you um, sort of deal with that cognitive dissonance? And so I read a lot about Mary Cheney. I just, I became fascinated by her as someone, another maybe kind of alter ego, like there's the, there's the made up Julie Wade with the surgeon in New England, but there's also Mary Cheney, like how, how did she live that life? So I read a lot of interviews and I read a lot of um, material um, commentary on the Cheney family. And um, so the poem that I will read has, has a lot of quotes in it too that, that are um, kind of staggering. So I have this notebook just full of, of things about the Cheney family and about Mary Cheney. And I still don't know how, <laughs> I don't know how Mary Cheney does it, how she like retains her relationship with that particular family and that particular party. Um, but I, I guess I write also to try to understand that better. And um, in this poem, like I, I felt really angry and in life I often feel angry, but I, I find that I channel it better um, into, into writing than I do into actually like being angry outright. So um, I guess, should I read it? Is that, um, sure. Mary Cheney, you know what they say about women like us, that we're dykes because we have daddy issues that we're queer because we aligned ourselves with the wrong parent early on, then grew a fondness for wide pant legs and flat heeled shoes, that we're bitter because nobody asked us to prom. Listen, this isn't me talking. I'm just trying to keep up with the pseudoscience. We might be lesbians because our, mother withheld the, our mothers withheld their approval all our lives, or perhaps because they never showed us how to mold the meatballs right. Your mother told Koki Roberts on national TV, Mary has never declared such a thing. At the time, you had been out and living with your partner for eight years. Maybe we watched too few episodes of Father Knows Best and or didn't identify enough with Jane Wyatt. Mother knows less, mother keeps quiet, mother makes him think it was all his idea. In 2000, your father said, I think we ought to do everything we can to tolerate and accommodate whatever kind of relationships people want to enter into. Gee, Dick, thanks for that rousing endorsement. I'm glad you can tolerate and accommodate the generous stick up your ass, all while still supporting the federal marriage amendment. Forgive me, Mary, he's your dad. If it helps, my father called him a real swell guy. And besides, my dad never said anything about tolerance or accommodation. Instead, quote, this whole homosexuality business started in the 1960s. 
Your mother and I got married, then watched the world around us fall to the fornicators and the bigamists and the sodomites. Note how he doesn't see a correlation there, that maybe their marriage tipped the iceberg towards some more promising alternatives. In 2004, you said you came very close to quitting your job on the Bush-Cheney re-election campaign. People were wearing buttons of the RNC that read, one man, one woman, as God intended, chanting it to, forget about quitting your job. I don't see how you didn't quit your party. Or maybe it's me who's lacking patience, compassion, the long-sightedness to see things through. Maybe I should stand in awe of such restraint. The fact you never seem to find the last straw in the haystack of shit they heap upon you. The payoff, you and Heather are still invited to spend Christmas in Jackson Hole. Meanwhile, I couldn't find my parents' second home on a map and they have never once uttered my partner's name. In your autobiography, you quote yourself as saying, Personally, I'd rather not be known as the vice president's lesbian daughter. Why not? Is it too reductive, too making an issue out of a person? See, I thought Republicans always liked that. I'm not fond of epithets or bald-faced denials, but I'd really get my back up if anyone presumed such a thing about me. Republican? Because my parents are? This apple fell so far from that blazing red tree, she has rolled into another garden. Lesbians love turquoise, I hear. Sapphire is my birthstone, cerulean the color of my aura, a psychic once said. Lavender menace, that's fine in theory, but Mary Cheney, come with me. Wouldn't you like to menace in blue? Amazing. Just, um, there's so much, there's so much in that poem. Um, so I'm going to ask you sort of the same question as before. Tell us about the origins of this piece. I know, I know you've, you, you talked before about studying them, but as far as the, as far as the poem itself, how long did it take you to write it? Um, and, 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 and what do you want us to get out of this piece. This, th this piece for, for me has two very important emotions. There's a tremendous amount of love and then there's also a tremendous amount of distance. And so talk to us about those feelings. Um, well, I guess I can say that this was one of those poems that I thought I was going to write. Um, like I had all my, my changes right and I thought um, I'm gonna write that poem and it won't be exactly in the the narrative sequence like I felt that the book should have some poems that could sort of be taken out um, of the of the building of the plot of what's happening in New England what's happening in Florida um, and so I knew that that would be one of those kind of poems but I circled around it for a long time I know um, I would have days where I thought this is the Mary Cheney day. And then I circled it and I didn't do it. And I wrote a different poem. Um, it was a harder poem to write. Um, I mean, it's, it's epistolary, right? Like I'm, I'm clearly writing directly to her. Um, and I like, I mean, I encourage my students to try epistolary poems because it can be really liberating to do and it can feel very intimate with someone, even if it's a person, I mean, I don't imagine I'll ever meet Mary Cheney and, and I certainly haven't met her um, before, but it's like that way of, of being able to say something that um, you imagine the other person can and will receive. Um, but it's interesting that you said distance too, because as I was writing it, I always feel a little distant when I start getting angry and when I start, you know, like saying exactly what I think and what I think isn't um, like a happy or positive thought. Um, so I guess I think the poem was hard to write for that reason because I was looking for a connection with her, but I kept coming up against the fact that um, just because we're both gay doesn't necessarily mean that we've made the same choices with our with our families or with our lives. And, um, that feeling of like imagining a connection with someone that in real life I, I probably wouldn't have. Um, I don't remember how long it took me to write it once I finally did write it, um, but it was definitely like that semester I had my goals and it just kept getting pushed to, so it was probably pretty late in the process of writing the book. Yeah, it's so amazing. And also as far as the distance goes, 
What's interesting too is that there's there's the personal distance distance that one sees within that within your own family as well too. That yeah, it, in true. some in some ways, Mary Cheney as a as a person doesn't necessarily need to exist in that poem. That there's much more going on with you and your life in that poem, and that she is a um, she's helpful to you in that poem. She is helpful for you to get certain things out in that poem, but the distance that is that that's there is so palpable in so many ways. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, that's a really good observation because I'm realizing now as I'm reading it and I don't know, it's not a poem I ever put on my, my own set list um, because I think it's the fact of saying like, oh, now, now I have to read that. I have to own all of those feelings um, in a way that's different than just having it in the book. Um, but it is true that there's some feeling that I had while writing the poem of, of also feeling a little bit jealous that, you know, well, Mary Cheney had that relationship with her father. Um, I mean, as far as I know, for, for his whole life and um, that, that connection between them was also there. And even though um, it was fraught, he was trying in this sort of meager way to like make room for her existence within a political party that wasn't forthcoming and receptive to it. Um, but that, that fact that she could have that relationship with him at all is also, um, yeah, it brings up a lot of complicated feelings when you start like writing in the letter format and you get so close and then you, you want to pull back as well. Sure. Yeah, absolutely true. All right. Uh, one more from this book um, okay. and maybe a little bit lighter. I, I mean, I'm a big fan mm -hmm. of pop cu culture and so I love pop cu culture. Um, Me too. And so <laughs> I can see that. So let's go to page 47 and set us up a little bit with this poem. Oh, this, okay. So this is the one poem. It's the, it's the odd poem out in the sense that, not that you would necessarily know that if you were reading the book through, but um, this poem um, exists for a couple of reasons. So two, two people really to thank. We always, I'm always telling my students that everything is, is an emulation in some way. And um, this poem was a kind of assignment. Um, when I started my PhD program in 2008, I took a creative writing workshop with uh, Paul Greiner, who's a tremendous fiction writer. Um, and the class was a multi-genre class. And he invited all of the graduate students to kind of kick off the class by writing a poem um, in the spirit of Kiki Petrosino, um, whose poet I'm a huge fan of. Um, and she just published her debut collection, Fort Red Border, where the speaker has this um, series of encounters with a man named Redford, um, who begins to appear to us as sort of a version of Robert Redford in his old screen days. Um, kind of pre-Sundance, but like the, the Robert Redford of the 70s and 80s. And um, so Paul Greiner said, why don't you all go try to write a poem about um, a relationship your speaker might have, like an odd or accidental, occasional kind of poem where your speaker might have an interaction with someone famous. Um, and it was, the instructions were to kind of find a setting that would be generative. And um, I remember thinking how much I loved reading Kiki's book and all the different scenarios that she imagines the speaker in with Redford. Um, and right at the time I was writing this, um, Portia Drossi and Ellen DeGeneres had gotten married and their wedding pictures were in all the People magazines. And I was feeling really happy every time I saw them in the grocery store, but also kind of sad because I was living in Kentucky and, and I didn't think that we would ever be able to get married um, in Kentucky or anywhere we might live. And so I was wishing them well, but also kind of wishing I could um, have my own wedding. Um, if I'm honest, that was kind of what I was thinking at the time. So um, I decided to write about Anne Heche because um, I was fascinated by her as well. And I had read her call me crazy and I was interested in having had that high profile relationship with Ellen for all those years. And I started to think, I wonder what she thinks when she sees People Magazine and she sees her longtime partner marrying someone else and at a time when they can legally marry and it can be in People Magazine and it can be the cover of People Magazine. Um, but I should say that I don't really play pool. Um, I mean, I'm sort of fascinated by pool, but it just, it came to me that like, I felt like Anne Heche might be hanging out in a bar um, around the time that they got married, like seeing it on every screen. And um, I just wanted to talk to her um, and imagine that scenario. So um, this is called Shooting Pool with Anne Heche the day after Ellen and Portia's wedding. For starters, the waiter was slow as fuck bringing our beers and Heche kept punching her tiny fist against her pink splayed palm and muttering, somebody's about to get clobbered. 
Ah, you're just sore, I say, trailing off, thinking about the backroom broadcast and the white on white cover of People magazine. Now she's snapping her gum and strutting around this green velvet like she owns the place. And I'm starting to feel that itch in my throat that means both intrigue and fear. Go ahead, she says. Tell me something terrible about myself. I could tell her how we call it getting haste when a woman you like or love leaves you for a man. I could explain that unlike the tired U-Haul jokes, she's still with us fresh as a paper cut that starts small, then seems to gnaw and gnaw. But when I look at her, quick appraisal under the low hanging light, her tight pale arms, her compact body beneath the red rib tank top and cut off shorts, it's a feeling like not quite attraction and not quite compassion. I play it off with a wave. I say, don't you know by now you're America's favorite has been? Yeah, I thought she'd like that. Heish takes a bow. Her taut green veins stand out everywhere in stunning ovation. The adrenaline glides from her hand to the cue on a luge of newly polished intention. God damn right I am, she grins. Now watch me put this ball in that pocket. It's such a wonderful um, fantasy to be able to have that conversation with somebody who is um, so part of American pop culture in that particular way, and to be able to play out a certain part of their life. Um, how is the reaction to this poem, Ben? What is, what, what is the reaction to this poem, Ben? Well, I remember that people seem to like it. I mean, I, I published it in a literary journal. I think, I think the literary journal was Dislocate. Um, and I was really excited when, when the editors um, made a, like a section in the, in the issue that, and it had like the, the words really big and on their side and it said, God damn right I am. And it was the beginning of the section of the journal. And I was like, oh, I love that. I love that they felt like some sort of, you know, um, affinity with that uh, response and like that it was empowering somehow and that that, that was the lead into the, the section. But um, in general, like that is a poem that I, I put in my set list more often because um, now more and more, I guess, some people um, who are who are a lot younger than I am may not know or recognize um, Anne Heche as having had that relationship to Ellen Generous. But definitely in, in 2008, when I first wrote the poem, there was a feeling of oh yeah, Anne Heche, and what about that memoir, Call Me Crazy? And like, you know, it was just a kind of, it was a fun scenario, but it also was a way to talk about, um, kind of to talk about without talking about how um, I felt a kind of strange empathy for her um, being in the situation where you can't, once again, you can't marry the person that you love, her, her situation, or once loved, the situation's different than mine, but it was still that feeling of like, oh, now, now someone else has the thing, but maybe in another time you could have had the thing. And so, um, I don't know, I, I found a, a compassion and, and a feeling of like, I just want to talk to her and, and they probably never will, but I can in a poem. Yeah, and it's interesting too, because we don't have a lot of examples of uh, gay couples, gay, lesbian, queer couples in popular culture. And so we're so used to seeing you know, movie stars and, and, and musicians and everybody else. I mean, we're so ingrained in that, but, but we don't actually see that many queer couples get together and break up in public. And so I kind of that's think true. that's an important, it's an important thing for us to think about. It was also redemptive because when I was um, about to graduate from high school in 1997, there was a Time Magazine cover with Ellen um, where she said, yep, I'm gay. And that was just a, like a revelation to me that was, I, I was not in any way even fully out to myself, but I just felt so thrilled to see her there. Like it was like she was speaking directly to me. And then um, all the things that followed that, the fallout and sort of the disappearance of Ellen for, for many years after that, there was a feeling that I had when I saw those people magazines all those years later in 2008, it was like, it took, it took 11 years for her to be back on the cover of something. But then in this case, like she's actually able to, 
marry the person that she loved. So that also felt like a mark of social progress that I just hadn't seen before. Yeah, and I mean, her history is certainly one that many of us in the gay community have watched. And I'm, I can't remember the name of the television program, but I remember when she was playing a gay character on a television program, but she was telling people publicly that she was straight. And yes, and so, um, and then when she actually came out, that was kind of, I mean, there are many of us, of course, who just assumed she was gay, but 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 it but it was it was the arc that she had to do, which all of us can identify with in some way or another. It's it's true. It's true. So let's let's switch gears a bit and uh, let's go to another book. Uh, uh, when uh, I was straight, um, it's hard for me to imagine when I was straight. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I don't know about about you, but um, let's let's start let's start on um, page twelve. Well, first of all, um, as we did with the last book, help everybody to understand the context of this of this particular book. Okay. Um, well, this book also has um, there are always people to thank, right? There's always emulation at work. Um, the I read a poem years and years ago um, by one of my favorite living poets, Denise Duhamel, didn't know her then, didn't know I'd ever meet her, um, but it was called When I Was a Lesbian, um, and I read it in her collection, Queen for a Day, New and Selected Poems, um, and I love this poem, and I love the idea that um, the, the speaker was sort of looking at like a time in her life, and that there wasn't this um, really firm edge to like you either are a lesbian or you aren't a lesbian but maybe there could be a time in your life where you identified one way and then it changed and the poem is is whimsical and playful but it's also um, really smart and um, complex in terms of identity and I love that poem and it made me think um, I read it when I already knew that I was a lesbian so it made me think about the opposite like if you grow up in this culture, you usually, um, unless maybe you have really um, progressive parents, and I hope more and more people do have those parents, but um, you're usually presumed to be straight um, until you say otherwise, and then there can be all kinds of consequences once you do say that. So um, I wasn't necessarily thinking of myself as like, oh, I was actually straight all my life until I was in my early 20s, but more that um, I was certainly raised and treated as though I must be straight and that there was no alternative. Um, and so I wanted to write an emulation of Denise's poem and it had been in my head for years, but then when I finally met her and we were going to be teaching together at the same school, I could say, hey, how would you feel about me writing when I was straight? And she said, that sounds great. And did you know, I wrote my poem after I read Maureen Seaton's poem, When I Was Straight. Um, and so then there was more history to the poem. So then I read Maureen's poem, When I Was Straight, and I loved it, and I love Maureen's work. Um, and Maureen is a fellow lesbian poet um, whose work I also adore. Um, so it kind of had all these valences of other people um, trying to tackle identity this way, like in, a, in an occasion poem. Um, and so I decided that I needed to write a When I Was Straight poem. Um, Denise and Maureen both ended up um, really blessing the project and blurbing the project. Um, but after I wrote one When I Was Straight poem, I realized, oh, I gotta write more of these. Um, so then there, there ended up being 11 of them um, because I, I did have a lot to say <laughs> about When I Was Straight, it turns out. Um, so I think the poem um, that you're asking for, this is the, um, the poem, um, oh, on page 12, yes. When I was straight, everything came to me vicariously. A promise, a postscript, a preview of coming attractions. Desire, a quiet rumor that rippled through the halls. At the cinema, someone always paid for popcorn. A soda with two straws, little licorice candies. I loved to sit in the back row and watch till all the credits rolled. You have a gift, the blonde boy said, for stalling. Later in a twin bed in a college dorm, I spoke without thinking. I like you, let's get this over with. His pink mouth amazed, so wide and round. Did you hear what you just said, he asked. I hadn't been listening. Oh, I think you're muted. There we go. Tell us, tell us a little bit about that piece. Well, I realized um, once I was 
it was clear I was going to have to write a lot of when I was straight poems to kind of sort through um, what that phrase meant to me. Um, I realized that, you know, a lot of, um, probably true for, for a lot of queer folks, that you spend a lot of time performing something that doesn't quite fit, but you see other people doing it and you see other people like dating and like going to the movies with, you know, a different sex person. And there's like all these rituals of that um, courtship and you, you see it in movies and then you go to movies and while you're at the movies, you see it in more movies. And so there's just a kind of feeling of like doing the thing you're supposed to do, which of course um, in my upbringing was very, very clearly a, a straight thing. Um, and so I, I wanted to kind of write these different ways that when I was straight meant in my life. And one of the ways that it meant was just, um, you know, you're a teenager now or a young adult. So you, you start dating and this is what dating looks like. And, um, you know, don't really question it. Like desire is just this rumor that's out there, like it's coming for you. Um, but I don't, I don't know that I really, um, I really found it until, um, you know, until much later. Um, and, and that desire then turned out to be very clearly a lesbian desire, but I was just kind of going through the motions and trying to, to really make it look like I was a great heterosexual. <laughs> yes, of course, that is something that we all aspire to, particularly when we internally know that that might not be the case. So um, if you would read us page 13 and 14. Okay. When I was straight, it was a shame it was a phase, it was a secret. I wanted every man I met. I courted danger on the dance floor. I was insatiable, I was indiscriminate. My lifestyle was visible in my haircut, my choice of shoes, tattoos I didn't have. I was insatiable, I was flamboyant. I couldn't get enough, lipstick, laundry detergent, sexy lingerie. I bought in bulk, I stocked my shelves. Some thought me unnatural. I was insatiable. I was derelict. At times, I found myself unable to stop talking about it, flaunting. I was insatiable. I was reckless. The doctor felt certain I would outgrow it. The pastor worried for my soul. What shall I do in the meantime, I wondered. For some, it was the most interesting thing about me. So, uh, <laughs> does it feel as if, um, does any of that still resonate with you today? Well, when I wrote this poem, it felt a little risky and I'm always trying to take risks in writing because I wanted to, I wanted it to be clear. Like I, I'm not a, a super satirical person. I'm always pretty sincere, pretty honest and straightforward, um, sort of punnily straightforward. Um, but I, this poem was really, um, I'm glad you asked me to read it because I almost never get to talk about it, that um, it was really like a satirical poem. Like I wanted to say, I made a catalog of what are the things people say about gay people, that it's a phase, um, that you'll outgrow it, um, you know, that it's unnatural, all these different things that, that I grew up hearing about gay people and I wanted to flip it, um, but I am never quite sure how the poem lands because I want people to hear in it that I'm, I'm just turning it around and saying all the things that people say about gay people, but then I'm adding in these little like, well, if people actually said those things about straight people, what would be the things that they would be doing? Like, it's, there's always this talk of your lifestyle if you're gay, right? But if you're if you're straight, I never hear anyone say like the straight lifestyle. Um, but I'm thinking like, okay, well, it would still be about your haircut and your choice of shoes. Maybe it would be the tattoos you didn't have instead of the tattoos you did. Um, the word flamboyant gets used a lot for gay people. So like, what if all those things were being tossed at the person who's straight, but then with these little twists, like the thing you can't get enough of, well, what if it was all the things we associate with like, traditional femininity like lipstick or traditional domesticity like laundry detergent. Um, so I was playing with those two things, but I'm not ever quite sure if the poem lands as, um, as a satire because um, of course those things aren't actually true in my experience, but it was the things that were being said when I came out um, that I'd like to reimagine how they would land differently if they had been the responses, like if the pastor was worried for my soul if I said, I'm straight, um, instead of the way that it actually happened. Um, so I'm never sure with that poem, but it, it was a risk I wanted to take to, to not have all the poems be kind of like one note, you know. And, and, and does, the risk, does the risk feel worth it to, today? 
Does it feel satisfying? Yeah, I mean, because I think even if that poem is, um, you know, like I've, I've been asked about that poem before by by people who have said, well, I was confused because I was going along and I was getting a sense of this person like performing heterosexuality, kind of going through the motions, you know, doing doing their their um, heterosexual course. And then, of course, the second half of the book is what happens after coming out. But then there's this poem where it seems like you're embracing all of those things. And so, um, but it's okay, you know, because I, I also tell my students, so I have to live by it myself, that once you let the poem out in the world, it's not yours in the same way anymore. So um, if the poem is, is mystifying um, or doesn't Seem, seems to break with the, the other speaker of the other When I Was Straight poems, that's okay. Maybe it leads to more conversation. Um, and then maybe that generates something that, um, that I can't control, but I also don't expect. So, so that's good too. Um, I'm happy that I took the risk. Oh yeah, and, and I, I'm happy you took the risk. I'm sure everybody is as well because it's so beautiful. <laughs> Just remind everybody, we only have about 10 minutes left. And so if you have any questions, um, for Julie, please feel free. You don't have to. Um, we're getting lots of nice uh, buzz here about people just saying wonderful and thank you, Julie. And, and of course, they're just lo loving having you here. Um, but if you have questions, post them on the, on the chat or the Q&A part. And so uh, can I ask you to move over to page 16 and 17? Um, because I think it's kind of fitting. Uh, it's kind of fitting with what you were just talking about. And can you read those for us? Yes, I would say this is a, definitely a partner poem to the other one, and um, so you'll, you'll hear why. <laughs> when I was straight, there were always theories to explain my disposition. I loved men because my father's love had been insufficient. I was deprived. I loved men because my father's love had been effusive. I was spoiled. I loved men because my mother loved men. I was a copycat. I loved men because my mother failed in her love of men. I was a show off. I loved men because my parents loved each other desperately. I was conventional. I loved men because my parents did not love each other enough. I was compensating for something. I loved men because I watched too much television. I wanted to be a contestant on Wheel of Fortune, which is true. I want to be a contestant on Wheel of Fortune. Um, and I noticed there, there never seems to be any, any gay folks or out gay folks on, on game shows. Um, but that is a, a poem that, that does kind of match. I mean, maybe it's a little um, more direct about what it's doing, but I, I just was thinking about all the things that people say about um, your disposition if the disposition isn't a straight one. And, and I thought that they're kind of absurd when you, I mean, they're absurd anyway, but they're absurd when you hear them applied to a heterosexual context. And I'm, I'm just always interested in like reversing the, reversing the script and seeing how it plays. And if it sounds really absurd when you turn it the other way, then maybe it was really absurd to begin with. Um, so these were, these were just my sort of like my experiment poems to, to test that out. Great. So we have a question from somebody uh, from a class that you visited in New, uh, oh, New Mexico. Oh, Lauren. Uh, Hi, Lauren. <laughs> And uh, her question uh, regards inclusion of your parents' written correspondence in your writing. In some ways, um, you're lucky their letters are so eloquent, even if uh, vitriolic. Um, how did you uh, contend with giving them space on your page, even if undeserved and or unknown by them? I mean, that's, that's a really good question. I mean, that's the question at the heart of anybody writing anything in the self-referential arts at all, right? Whether uh, confessional poetry or um, memoir, creative nonfiction that has any um, self-referencing and family referencing. Um, but I think for me, I mean, one of the reasons that I write so much about my family is because I'm always trying to understand them. And, and that seems like a, like a universal thing. Like we're all trying to figure out in some way where we came from, who we came from. Um, and I don't, I don't think, I, of course I have anger about injustice and about homophobia at large, but I also have um, compassion for um, my parents. And even though they embody some of those things, I, I wanna understand how they came to hold the values that they hold. And so um, usually I think when I'm writing them, I try to 
um, hopefully I'm not doing the thing that I caution my own students about, which is like revenge writing, which um, I want to show that they do have complexity and even um, I think a lot of creativity because um, in same sexy marriage, right? The, the, the thing that I discovered in writing that was that I had never felt more um, connected to my mother than when I wrote about my mother inventing an alternate me. And I didn't know that that was gonna happen when I, when I set out to write those poems, but I really thought, wow, I mean, I'm a writer and I create things on the page that help me you know, I'm experimenting in these poems, trying to figure out why do people say that about gay people's dispositions? Um, but then here's my mother. And even though the ethics of it may be and are really uh, questionable to just invent another daughter and then have to spin this story, it's, it's like recognizing that my mother's a creative writer too. Um, and I hope that we have different objectives in our work. Um, and I guess maybe she's more of a fiction writer than I am. But there's that feeling of like in writing about them and writing about they're uh, writing to me or they're speaking to me. I think I do get a fuller sense of, of who they are and, and they're just as complicated as I am. Um, so I think that's why, that's why they're not uh, stricken from the record. And you know, years ago I read um, this beautiful Mary Oliver poem, um, The Leaf in the Cloud, this book length poem, um, which is one of my favorite books. And um, she has this moment where she says, I speak of them here, I will not speak of them again. And she's referring, the speaker's referring to her parents. And I just remember thinking, wow, I can't do that. I can't. Well, I, of course, and, and, and I have to say, there's no revenge. In the, I, I don't see any re revenge in the work that you're, that you're doing here. This is not revenge writing, of course. And it's just, it's just honesty. That's, that, it's that's good it doesn't come across that way because that's definitely not the intention. So I'm, I'm glad you see that, Hunter. So um, to, to wrap up here, um, can I ask you to sort of talk about your experience um, through your poems? And we'll start with page 36, 37, 38, 39. And of course, um, you have to end at page 42. So it's kind, okay. of a long, it's kind of a long reading, but I think it's a wonderful way to sort of bring all of this uh, together. Okay, um, so the second half of When I Was Straight, um, I mean, that's the title of the whole collection, but the second half are all poems. Um, they're also when poems, but they're when various people um, find out uh, that I am a lesbian. So um, I'll start, and I can actually, yeah, I can read them pretty pretty readily all the way through, and, and I'll, um, I'll end with uh, My Father, which is the last poem in the book. When the whole office learns I am a lesbian. Have you ever been to Provincetown? How did you like Brokeback Mountain? Do your parents know? My cousin is gay and lives in West Virginia. Was it hard for you in high school? I want you to know I voted for Al Gore. The Indigo Girls are the best group I ever saw in concert. Really, you don't look it. The Jesus fish on my car is from a previous owner, I promise. I want you to know I voted for John Kerry. My mechanic is gay. I bet he'd give you a good deal on an oil change. Do you play golf? Do you play softball? Do you play tennis? How do you meet people? Is it mostly online? My high school English teacher was gay. She loved Edna St. Vincent Millay. Do you wish you could get married? Do you watch The Ellen Show? Do you love Edna St. Vincent Millay? I want you to know I voted for Barack Obama. When John at the YMCA learns I am a lesbian, I know he stammers. His ruddy cheeks dapple all kinds of purple, a visual hyperbole. So if you already know, I press him, wiping my face with a towel. Why are we even having this conversation? When an old classmate learns I am a lesbian. This is a persona poem, so I'm gonna have to do this voice um, and hopefully not laugh. Oh my God, I knew it. I always knew it. I was like, Julie is so gay. And people were like, oh, whatever. You just think everybody's gay because it's an all girl school. But I knew I wasn't gay. And I knew most of those girls weren't gay. So I was like, fuck you, Jasmine. Go suck on one of your Jolly Rancher rings. Do you remember those? 
So how's it going? Do you have a girlfriend or something? I have to tell you in college, I had a gay roommate and she got lucky like every single night. Seriously, I'd come back to the room and there'd be some ribbon tied around the door. So I'd have to like hang out by the vending machines in the lobby looking like a total loser. I never saw the girls go though. I guess they must have gone out the fire escape or something. Nobody thinks there would be that many gay girls in Iowa, you know, but I guess they're kind of everywhere now. Do you still live on the West Coast or what? If I were gay, I would be like, San Francisco, here I come. But truth be told, it's kind of dirty. My boyfriend took me there once. Well, we're actually engaged, so technically he's my fiance now, but you know, he wasn't then. So we just walked around a lot and got some of that good chocolate and saw the seals. And I was like, hey, isn't there some really cool old prison that you can see if you take a ferry from here? And then he was like, San Francisco is full of fairies, ha ha. I hope that doesn't offend you. I mean, I thought it was funny, but my boyfriend is like totally down with gay people. He would really like you because you're smart and it's kind of hot when a girl isn't into you at all you know well I guess you would want a girl to be into you huh so scratch that but I mean most girls are always trying to get with him and then I have to be like whoa hands off that's my man sometimes I think it'd be so much easier to be gay it would just take all the pressure off I wouldn't have to get my hair done or worry how my boobs looked and if somebody called me fat I could just be like I'm a lesbian douchebag I mean seriously do you even have to wax um, and then switching gears a little dramatically. Um, when the foreign exchange student learns I am a lesbian, touching my cheek with concern, didn't you ever want to be something important with your life? And when my father learns I am a lesbian, a cursor flashes on his lips, but 11 years and still no comment. <laughs> that last one always leaves me weeping. It's so hard. <laughs> That's why I, I rarely read it, but I, I, I knew you wanted me to read it. And I was like, I'm prepared. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. But it means a lot to me that it's moving. I mean, that's, that's the point I hope. Um, Cause it's really hard to talk about when there's silence, you know, um, especially around something like you can come, but it needs to be alone. We're not going to acknowledge why you wouldn't be alone. So like that, it's hard to talk about that. And um, I, I guess it was hard because I had to say so little to make it clear how much silence there is, so. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> and again, oh, you did an amazing okay. job. <laughs> you did, I need more, more water. You did an amazing job. But anyway, um, folks, uh, if this has been an amazing, Julie, this has been just an amazing pleasure to have you here. Um, it's been great. Um, Thank you for having me. Uh, it's just, it's, it's been so nice. Uh, Julie, we're getting more things coming in saying about how fabulous this is and people have just enjoyed you. I thank you so much for your generosity and sharing your work and actually talking about your work in this way. Because for all of us who make things, it's so important for us to actually hear from others about how the process works. And so your generosity as a teacher and as a poet has been so meaningful to everybody. So thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. I know I can't see you, but I also know you're there. So it means a lot. thank you for having me, Hunter. I really appreciate it. That's great. And so uh, just remind everybody, uh, we're doing these events uh, every week. Um, Next week, uh, um, Julian Capo will, will be here, and it's a wonderful historic um, book about Miami uh, from uh, the beginning of the 20th century until, 19, uh, until the 1940s, about the gay and queer community that, grew, that grew, grew up in Miami here. And so I'm very much looking forward to having him. If you don't get our newsletter, uh, like everything else, go to our website, stonewall-museum.org and you can get our newsletter. I'm sure we're probably gonna sign you all up for it anyway. You can always unsubscribe if you don't want one more email, but trust me, we're doing a lot of great, great things and so you're gonna want them. Um, uh, this uh, reading will be posted on our website. Give us about four or five days to get that done. We're very busy uh, and trying to get things, um, get, get things posted. And uh, last, I have to say thank you to Emery Grant. Emery has been- thank behind you, Emery. <laughs> And Emery has been behind the scenes here, making sure everything is working properly and this all seems so seem. Oh, there's Emery. Hello, Emery. Uh, and so nice to see you. Thank you. 
And uh, Julie, I don't know what else to say, except it was just a delightful hour. It was great to talk to you about your work. And you. uh, I hope you have a very productive summer. Um, number one, you're moving to a new home and number, or you have moved to a new home. And number two, you need to get some writing done. And so I hope it's very pr productive for, for you. Thank you so much. I, I feel certain it will be. Good. All right. Bye, everybody. I uh, hope Bye. to see you all, see, see you all next week. Thank you.